Today we are talking about unit two cells, concept two notes, which is all about cell transport. So the movement of things in and out of the cell. Why should we care about that? Why does that matter? Because of homeostasis, that's why. Homeostasis is the need of an organism to stay stable by regulating its internal conditions. And this isn't a static thing. It's actually dynamic. We call it a dynamic equilibrium. So things aren't always exactly the same. For instance, think of your body temperature. It is not always 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever temperature it is supposed to be. It, it, it fluctuates. But as long as it stays within a given range, you're considered to be okay and not have a fever or anything like that. That's how homeostasis works as well. Things don't stay static in one exact position. They fluctuate, but as long as things are maintained within certain ranges, then everything is all good. So there's a ton of things that are regulated. pH, for instance, how acidic or how basic um, the environment is. There are different pHs for different areas um, in different places. Temperature, whether things need to be cold or hot, blood sugar, hypoglycemic versus hyperglycemic. So we're trying to maintain ranges here. How do we do that? Well, organisms are constantly taking in stimuli and they're then having to respond to those stimuli in order to maintain homeostasis. So stimuli is just plural for stimulus. A stimulus is a change in an environment. And then the response is just the change in the organism as a result of that stimulus. So how is the organism as an individual going to respond? So for instance, if an animal experiences an extreme drop in temperature, that would be a stimulus. That would be a change in their environment. How would they respond in order to survive. This is a critical, the stimulus and response this is a critical theme of biology. It's going to come up a lot um, throughout the year, but today we're going to kind of talk about how this goes down on a cellular level. So not just, you know, an organism shivering um, in order to warm up, but what's going on cellularly to make that happen. So there are these feedback mechanisms within your cells and they've evolved to help maintain homeostasis. Um, as we organisms are responding to these stimuli in our environment. So what these mechanisms do is they use the output of a system to signal a change in the input so that then the response of the system is either stabilized or it can even be amplified if we're trying to send some sort of signal. And these mechanisms can be positive or negative. Now I know I'm saying just a ton of, I feel like I'm talking so science right now and so many biology terms. I think it's going to make sense as I give you some specific examples. So let me do that now. Let's talk about positive feedback mechanisms. So in a positive feedback mechanism, or sometimes it's referred to as a loop, the output is going to, or the product is going to loop back and it's going to intensify the response. Okay, here's what I mean by that. Or we can, we can call it intensify or it can amplify. It's amplification. Okay, so human childbirth. Fun process. Um... Essentially, you have these hormones when it's time for the baby to come, um, hormones, or if it's the time for the baby to come and your baby doesn't want to come, they will artificially give you these hormones and induction like I had to experience. But basically, these hormones come, they cause um, your uterus to contract, and this creates pressure. And that pressure, that output of the system causes the release of more hormones, which cause more contractions, which causes more pressure. And it just keeps amplifying and amplifying until the baby is then born. Um, another not as traumatizing example is fruit ripening. So when fruit ripens, I think about the bananas that sit on my counter every week when I buy them from the grocery store. As they ripen, so as they get more and more yellow and brown, they release ethylene, and this signals the fruit surrounding um, it to also ripen, and then the ones around it ripen, and they release more ethylene. And so it's this um, it's this chain reaction, if you will, this loop that is going to cause more and more fruit to ripen that is near it. Um, that is a positive feedback loop or amplifying. In a negative feedback mechanism or loop, the output or the product of the system is going to do a counter response. We're trying to return back to a set point. We're trying to stabilize. 
Um, an example of this is human body temperature or thermoregulation. So for instance, if you are outside, it is currently 98 degrees where I live right now. We're in the heat index is like 107. We're under a heat advisory. So if I was to walk outside, my body temperature would rise within minutes. And my body as a way to respond would start to, I would have sweat happen, which would help to cool down and lower the temperature. So the output is going to start stabilizing the input. Other examples um, we'll talk about are water concentration or osmoregulation, and then how blood sugar is regulated as well. This, these are all negative feedback loops. Okay, so on a cellular level, cell homeostasis is maintained via the cell membrane or the plasma membrane by controlling what is going to come in and out of the cell. By controlling at a cellular level, it then works its way up to control what's going on at an organism level. So the cell membrane, because of the phospholipid bilayer and its structure, which we've talked about in concept one and we talked about it in unit one as well, it is selectively permeable. All that means is it's picky about what it's going to let go in and out. Things that can get through this cell membrane easily are small molecules, nonpolar molecules, hydrophobic or afraid of water, or neutral. Um, now, water can also make its way through. If you remember from concept three, unit one, water is polar, but water is really tiny, so it's able to make it through the cell membrane easily in small amounts. In large amounts, it needs help. What cannot pass easily are polar and or large molecules. They need help getting through the cell membrane. And because of these differences in what can go in and out of the cell, the transport of materials in and out is classified as either being passive or active. So here's what that means. Passive transport requires no extra energy by the cell. Molecules are able just to naturally move from where they're highly concentrated or really squished and packed together to low concentration or where they're really spread out. So we say this is the movement of molecules down their concentration gradient. Think about when you sit at the top of a slide, it's easy to just go down the slide. It's easy to move from high to low. It's passive. There are three examples of this we'll talk about. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Active transport requires extra energy in the form of ATP and to be spent so that we can either bring materials into the cell or expel them out. And we're moving them against their concentration gradient, so from areas of low to high. So think about going up a slide. So from the lower part to the higher part, that's going to take extra energy than to go down. Examples are molecular pumps, exocytosis, and endocytosis that we'll be talking about. So a couple words to know before we go further. Think of a solute. Um, we talked about this in unit one. It's what gets dissolved. Solvent does the dissolving, and then the solution is a uniform mixture of the two. So think of so lemonade powder would be a solute, water would be the solvent, and then the solution would be lemonade. Concentration is the amount of solute dissolved in solvent, and we abbreviate it with these brackets. So some high concentration would be like a ton of solute. So think of like super strong sour lemonade. Low concentration would be low solute. So it would be like really watery lemonade, like your ice melted hours ago type of lemonade. Okay, so we're going to be using some of those words. So first we're going to talk through three examples of passive transport. One is simple diffusion. When you think of simple diffusion, I want you to think of bacon. Okay, it is the spreading out of molecules across the membrane until equilibrium is reached. Equilibrium just means we're equally concentrated on both sides. Molecules move down the concentration gradient, so down the slide, from high part of the slide, the high concentration, to area of low concentration. Okay, so think about if you've ever been in your house and you've woken up to the smell of bacon. If you're in the kitchen where the bacon's being made, the smell is so strong. But over time, that smell of bacon diffuses throughout your house. It moves from high concentration in the kitchen to low concentration, the other rooms of your house or your apartment or wherever you live. And it diffuses naturally. It's not taking any effort. No one's blowing a fan to try to spread the smell of bacon around, although that would be an excellent idea. It's just naturally, passively happening. That's what's going on here. This is how oxygen and carbon dioxide and a couple other small nonpolar molecules move in and out of the cell. 
So let's look at this picture. Let's pretend that this dotted line, if you're taking notes, draw this in your notes. This dotted line represents our selectively permeable cell membrane, okay? Notice this side is more highly concentrated. This is low concentration. So how do we, what do we expect to happen over time? We expect it to move from high to low until we reach equilibrium, until they're balanced. So over time, it'll naturally look like this where it's balanced on either side of the membrane. Okay, facilitated diffusion. So simple, it's just happening on its own. Facilitated, you just need a little bit of help, just a tiny bit, okay? So a transport protein is gonna act as either a protein channel or a carrier, and it's gonna help facilitate the diffusion of molecules that normally can't get through the cell membrane. So it's gonna move molecules down the concentration gradient still from high to low, but it's gonna help bigger molecules like glucose, which is sugar, and polar molecules that have a charge like calcium. Okay, so similar picture, and we're still gonna move from high to low, but we're gonna to have to go through or use a protein in order to do it. And then over time, we'll have that nice balance. Okay, osmosis. This is just the dis simple diffusion of water across the cell membrane. Now, what makes this a little trickier? Water is gonna move down the gradient from high water concentration to low water concentration until equilibrium is reached. So high water concentration means low solute. So watery to low concentration, really concentrated, really sour lemonade. Okay, so let's look at this picture. Think of this as lemonade, even though this is our cell membrane, okay? This side has much more lemonade powder than this side. See the red dots? So this one would be much more sour, this side much more watery. So water moves from high to low water concentration. This is a higher water concentration than this side because it's more watery, it has lower solute. So water is going to move this direction till over time it balances out in concentration, not necessarily volume. Okay, so this is what this does to your cells. This is really important because so much of the fluid outside and inside the cell is water. When a cell gets put into a hypertonic solution, the water concentration is lower than the cell cytoplasm. So the water concentration outside the cell is lower than what's inside the cell. So water is going to rush out of the cell and that's going to cause the cell to shrivel up. If a cell gets placed in a hypotonic solution, I think hypo like a hippo. Water concentration is higher in that solution outside the cell than it is inside the cell. So water is going to rush into the cell and the cell is going to swell up. Iso, think identical. That's when a cell gets placed in an isotonic solution. It's identical water concentration in and out. Water is going to move in and out equally and the cell's size is going to stay the same. All right, let's summarize that another way visually. So hypertonic, if I place this cell in a hypertonic solution, that means there's less water outside, more water inside. Water goes from high to low, so it's gonna rush out and the cell's gonna shrivel up. In a hypotonic solution, the cell is placed in a solution that has more water outside than inside. So water rushes in and the cell's gonna swell up. Isotonic, it's the same in and out, so water moves in and out equally. The cell's going to stay the same size. Okay, last three types of transport we're going to talk about are related to active transports. Remember, these are moving against the gradient from low to high, so we're going to go up the slide, so it's going to require extra energy to do it. One type of this is um, molecular pumps. So a cell is going to use energy to pump molecules across the membrane against that concentration gradient and through a protein channel. This, why would the cell do this? It would do this because it wants to concentrate certain molecules within the cell or outside the cell and then, or remove waste quickly. Potassium, chlorine, sodium, these are all ions or charged particles. They're all moved through molecular pumps. So we have this picture. In a molecular pump, we're actually gonna go this way. We're gonna use energy to go against the gradient and keep pumping them from low to high so that over time it's really concentrated on one side. Okay, the last examples of active transport require using vesicles, so those little carts that move things around the cell. One example is endocytosis. This is when the cell uses vesicles to move large particles into the cell. So white blood cells will take in bacteria and then try to and destroy it once it's within the cell to fight infection. 
And again, this requires energy. Exocytosis uses vesicles to export things out of the cells, we can see here. So like when a nerve cell is going to secrete a neurotransmitter to send signals throughout the body, it will do that using exocytosis. Okay, I know that was so much information, so we're going to take some time now in class to summarize it and just to practice, practice, practice until you get this.